presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, they're in their 30s, unmarried and happy. While Americans are staying single and childless longer, some are creating different kinds of families. I talk with an author who's explored these so-called urban tribes next on Dialogue. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. A welcome as well to those of you tuning in on public radio and the World Wide Web. Magazine writer Ethan Waters was just trying to make sense of his own life when he wrote an article that defined a trend. Still in his 30s and single, Waters felt, well, fine. He had his job, financial security, and most importantly, his friends. So he decided to see what others like him were feeling. The result, a piece in which he coined the term urban tribes. It got so much response that he wrote a book by the same name. In it, Waters hypothesized that often unmarried people in cities are supported by their social networks in the same way, or even better, than they would be in their own family. I spoke with him at the Sun Valley Writers Conference. For more than a decade, the conference has been bringing together authors from around the world to talk about current issues in literature and life. I started by asking Waters about his own life when he wrote the book. I think like a lot of people, I was, I guess at the time, 35, and I uh, began to look at my life, and, and, and mostly in relationship to my parents' life, and thought, well, what were they doing at 35? And, you know, when they were 35, they had me, you know, I was four years old or, or so, and uh, they had careers that seemed much further along. They, you know, had the house in the suburbs, and, um, and you reach 35, and you're still single in the city living with your friends. It's time to take a look at your life and began to wonder, what am I doing with this time? And, and um, there's a lot of anxiety out there in culture these days of uh, people dismissing this time of life. And I wanted to look at this, you know, the, you know, the, the never married, as I call them, and the urban tribe years, and, and try, to find, try to see if there was a justification for them. Um, and what I found was, um, you know, stories that went all over the map in terms of people engaging this freedom, doing wonderful things with it, living very valuable and uh, fulfilled lives, all the way to people who were, uh, once they saw the freedom in their life, sort of froze up. They, you know, they could not figure out for the life of them what to do with that time. So there's a lot of different outcomes for, the, for those never married years, but um, I tried to focus a little bit on the, the positive ones because I think the negative ones, you know, the kids that go to college and then go and live in their mother's basement, you know, they get, they get a lot of press these days. Or the, the friends, you know, um, you know, people that can't figure out their lives at all, they tend to get a lot of press. And, and I think there's a lot more going on in this time than we've uh, seen. Part of the phenomenon of this is, is the Internet. And uh, you, you were flooded with emails from people from around the world saying, hey, I'm part of... A That's quote, like me. Uh, yeah, I'm part of a quote urban tribe, and so what resulted is is this book out of out of that single article. Yeah, it's always fun as a magazine journalist to hit that note that you know you do it two, two or three or hopefully four times in your career. You write the piece that everyone suddenly talks about for a little bit, because um, and, and I think honestly it's not that I certainly invented the notion of the urban. The, the, I didn't invent the urban tribe itself. It existed out there in culture. I gave it a name. I gave it respect. Uh, in that little piece for the New York Times Magazine, and, and people instantly got it. And it's interesting how things in our culture can go, uh, we can be blind to them until we tell a story about them. And sometimes that's done by a, a, you know, on, you know, by a, a writer, um, sometimes it's done in other ways, but it's fun to be the first person to sort of name something and give it a story and give it a little meaning. And then all the energy that's behind those groups suddenly gets, suddenly is, is, is spoken into culture. I imagine it can start to become a little bit of a millstone, though, because you have moved on to other things, and and you know, aren't you'll always be probably associated with right. with the one phenomenon. Well, yeah, not only did I move on to other things as a writer, but I, <laughs> I, I wrote about my single years, the the last year of my single life. I was I actually uh, the epilogue of the book is written from my honeymoon, and so it w in a way, it was it was me looking at my own life and and giving it its place and in, in time, and then moving on from it, so leaving it behind. So you wrote, I mean, you, you know, partly in response to Robert Putnam's 
um, treatise called Bowling Alone, which uh, you know pretty much bemoaned the fact that people nowadays don't seem to be joining groups like they used to that were disassociated. And your point was, well, there are these groups, yes. and actually they're they're serving a, a valid function because uh, these urban tribes, these groups of people living or working near each other, are helping each other in very real ways. In very real ways. And uh, Robert Putnam's uh, uh, book was a remarkable uh, book, and it, and it tracked a very troubling trend, which is that organizations your parents belong to, the League of Women Voters, the Lions Clubs, the memberships of those things are just dropping off the map. You know, the younger generations are not joining those groups. And he was very worried about it. I think it's right to be worried about it. What he missed, I think, was that these friendship groups are very difficult to count. They're just, they exist within people's lives. There's no membership roles. There's no way to see them as a statistician. You have to go in them and ask questions about them and see them sort of on the ground. Um, and, and I think, I, I think it's true. That, and they do more than just, you know, uh, you know, buy the burrito for you or, you know, help you find the girlfriend. They're, they're helping you find jobs. They're helping you negotiate uh, city life, which is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and they help in all manners of ways. In fact, in, and I would make the case in, in a lot of ways more significantly than those, those social groups that your parents belong to. Some worry about that, though. I, you know, some worry, hey, it's that's yeah, it's so self-centered to just be helping your friends. What about getting involved in the wider community yeah. and helping volunteer? Absolutely, and I think that's the challenge for these urban tribes. They're great at helping friendships, the, the friend, you know, the roommate, the friend. Um, but what are they doing for the people that you that aren't in your social group? You know, the people on the other side of the tracks, or the or the people that are not from your demographic group. Where can you know what? And and honestly, they're not doing that much, uh, or that some of the groups are not. They really are focused on the inwardly. And I think it's the challenge for these groups. If we can identify friendship groups as uh, you know, tell a story about them, give them a name, perhaps uh, understand that that's where our social capital lies. If, only if we recognize that can we then turn that energy and say, okay, what can we do with it? What can we, how can we you know, start a philanthropy? How can we start a group together? The San Francisco Writers Grotto, which is now an office space of 33 writers in San Francisco, um, was started with Ethan Kanan and Poe Bronson um, from this energy. It was a friendship group that became something real that now has, you know, teaches classes and does public events and brings people in. and. Um, and, it, and it, it was really the motivation for this book was to say, okay, recognize it, see it, now do something more with it. Like, don't just let it be a friendship group, do something more with it. Many people in these urban tribes, frankly, have the time and the luxury, uh, the money in some instances, to do this, to kind of take a break for a decade or so. You say, in the long run, most of us knew we had an ace in the hole. Many of us were in line to be the beneficiaries of the largest transfer of wealth that had ever taken place from one generation to another. So is this just kind of an elite idea that we have these? Uh, right. It moves? is uh, a little bit. And, that, and, and, and not for the worst reasons. It's actually just for a very specific reason, which is the marriage delay itself has taken effect mostly with college educated people and college educated women in particular, I think, were the fuel for the delay suddenly we have a generation that not only had opportunities, but were really pursuing those opportunities. They were graduating from college, doing challenging careers, or getting a master's, a PhD, and suddenly they were delaying the marriage and starting the family into their late 20s and uh, often 30s. The energy for the urban tribe comes from that group. They, they're, they're outside a family unit. They're, they're living far from their families oftentimes. They're, they're jumping from job to job or school to school. So they have to find, we're human creatures, we have to find some sort of social network and social home in our life. So it, so it tended to be, uh, you know, the college-educated kids that were, were doing this. Um, in small-town America, you still find, you know, the people that don't go to college get married very young, still. Well, so I'm there's a split. I'm seeing even in, in urban America, uh, young people, again, getting married young yeah. and starting to have children. We're seeing kind of a baby boomlet, if you yep. will. And I see quite a few young people uh, getting married. Sure. So is this starting to wane, do you think? Well, if there's a swing back, I, I don't, well, I think what's happening, honestly, is, is, is not one single trend. It's, it's multiple trends. And so now we're seeing a generation that it, it is as normal statistically to get married and have a kid at 21 as it is at 31 or you know in your late 30s so you just have this tremendous spread so 
if you take the average, you'll see the average marrying age going up. But what you're actually seeing is a diffuse, you know, like uh, in, in the 50s, you'd see a very tight grouping of when people got married and had, had their first child. And now it's simply all across your 20s and 30s. So um, you're right, there's counter trends. And I think there'll be a little bit of swing back as this next generation of young women looks ahead to the women that went before them and delayed marriage. And some missed the opportunity to have children. Uh, and some, some didn't get married. They make may make different decisions. They may think, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that idea of getting married and having children into my late t 20s, you know, at the latest. Getting married is a very difficult thing to decide to do on one's own. And what I mean by that is to not have the social pressures that would lead you to making that decision. And if you think back in the 50s, you had the parents very involved in a young adult's life, you know, the church, all the friends getting married, all that social pressure sort of helps you make that decision. When you're 25 years old and, and the world is basically saying to you, get married whenever, you know, you know, and there's the tax issues, but I don't think any 25 year old thinks about the tax consequences. But it says, you know, figure it out whenever, get married, live together, you know, date, um, but you figure it out. And, and it turns out that, the, the, that getting married is actually sort of requires a little bit of that social pressure. It's a difficult decision to make. You want some people to say, this is a good time to do it, or that's a good person to get married to, you know. And everyone's very hands off these days, especially parents, I think, of 30 year olds. They don't know what to say to their 30 year old when they're uh, single and trying to figure this out. They're not as, um, you know, in, in their kids' life as other, other generations were. So then do you think it's appropriate then for the government to encourage marriage through its policies? I'm a big advocate of marriage and, uh, you know, having gotten married after the book, I think it's the, I don't think it's something that uh, people should skip. I think it's a very important institution. I think there's actually great news about marriage within this delay trend. And the great news is that, that later marriages tend to be the ones that are surviving longer. They already statistically can see that. Um, so I think to delay marriage, become a fully fledged person, you know, at, in both in terms of emotionally and perhaps financially, then to join your life with another person when you're in your late 20s, I think is going to strengthen marriage. I mean, we, you know, the generation before us um, didn't do a lot for the institution of marriage. I mean, there's massive divorce rates, um, huge discontent within the family. And I think uh, ultimately, even though we appear to be avoiding marriage for a pe period of our lives, we're going to rescue the institution. Because, it, as you write, uh, you're elevating the idea of marriage because you're actually looking for the person who will be that right person, even right. if it takes some time. That's right. And we're not doing it, as I say, I think in that early article, we're not, we're not making the marriage decision as someone, as a, as a high school senior would make the decision to go to college, but sort of like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do next. You know, we're making the decision more studiously. When we go to the altar, we're actually in a way, you know, we're turning away from this group of friends that has sustained us uh, in a way for the, that period of life. We're actually giving something up and, and, and devoting ourselves to the family unit. And I think that added um, sacrifice and that added intentionality of it is actually going to make us, you know, commit more to marriage as opposed to just sort of drift into it. So ultimately, after writing this book and I assume receiving thousands of emails afterwards, did you come away with the conclusion that these urban tribes are delaying the institution of marriage or providing a safe haven for people who would be doing that anyway uh, and just and need some some friends and some support yeah. in the meantime? Well, you know, out of all the stories that I collected, I, w I ended up with a sort of mixed impression. I mean, I could look at certain urban tribes and think, you know, what you're doing is just an extension of your college years, and that's not that healthy. It's a, a lot about drinking and, and dating and partying, and it doesn't seem to be helping you become a fully fledged adult. And I look at other, other tribes and just see these remarkable people helping each other out during um, a very interesting social transition period. I worry also, you know, at the, at the end of the tribe years, you know, you, you reach your mid thirties, you know, which is delaying marriage a long time, um, how easy it was for people to extricate themselves from the tribe, to get out of the tribe and to turn towards a romantic partner and say, let's have a family. And I, I, I did notice a, a lot of stories of the tribe being resistant to letting you go. The tribe is almost like another, you know, romantic partner in your life that gets jealous of, the, of, of someone else coming on the scene. And uh, I worried about, you know, people in that situation. Um, it, it's hard to change gears. 
Um, and it's easy to go on living a, a life of, you know, in a group of friends. So can you have a suburban tribe or a rural tribe, or is it really something that's unique to cities? You can, but again, the marriage delay happens more in cities because it has more of those challenging careers um, that go on in the suburbs and the smaller towns are, the, are still be the, tend to be the ones where people get married earlier. And what did you find out about the adage that uh, this is happening because women are just too picky? Oh, that's just part of the anxiety. You know, that's you know, all those stories of women are too picky or men are be, have become suddenly become jerks or, um, you know, that's all the sort of sitcom answer to the to the question. And it's much more complicated than that. It's much more interesting, and uh, you know, so. But you know, a lot of the a lot of the answers to these questions that people had in their minds came out of TV shows like Friends or, or Seinfeld, where um, you know people were just li living these sort of ridiculous lives. Um, and for the, and I think the humor of those shows came out of the anxiety that surrounded this sort of suddenly new period in, in the human life. Well, and there's such a focus in the entertainment industry on those actors and whether they've gotten married yet and whether they've That's had true. children yet. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I almost think sometimes the, the baby boomlet now that we're seeing is, is in part due to people watching this focus on the entertain, entertainers having yeah. children at a, at a late age or, yeah. and, and how cool it is. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about something you wrote that, that about our, our generation. You and I are not, I, I'm slightly older than you are. I won't say how much older, but within the same generation, I think. And you, you, you wrote that you think that our generation has no sense of shared, had no sense of shared mission, no notion that we were a generation chosen for some higher purpose. Yes. I kind of understand what you mean, having, being your age, there was, you know, Vietnam War was over, yes. World War II was over. That's right. But I guess I, I, I would wonder if you need that kind of external threat in order to oh, do, so. do something good oh. for, for, for others, I mean, or to motivate you to help others. I mean, why do you need that uh, oh, sh shared mission? And right. maybe, maybe we have it now with the next generation with global yeah. warming, with the war in Iraq. Yeah. It seems to be motivating. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. The global warming seems, in particular, seems to have some some energy behind it. I was making that point largely just to point out that that the amount of freedom this you know sort of Gen Xers and Gen Yers have, um, both in terms of you know the things they think about, the things they do, the way they think, the way they dress, and so forth. And I think in the you know in the seventies or sixties, the seventies, the baby boom generation came of age. You had this uh, sense that there was this tremendous freedom out there, and uh, you know we're all doing it, you get something new, and it's all exciting. And you look back at it, and you, what you see is a much more homogenized, stylized freedom that you, everyone was acting like they were free. And yet, you know, it's you know that old Steve Martin joke where you all chant together, "We are all free." You know, that, that it's actually not freedom; it's a style. It was a style. It was a style of the times. But you, you feel like if there had been a shared mission, like some sort of outside threat from communism or the Vietnam War, that our generation would have been more motivated to be outward directed? When you say our generation, you're talking about baby boomers? Well, you're in your 40s, so yeah. you're right I'm, a, I'm on the edge of the baby yeah. boomer Gen X, but I, I, I would identify, or at least I did identify more with the Gen X. Okay, yeah. and I guess I identify with the, baby the, boomers, the next yeah. one up, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, I think the Vietnam War obviously did uh, do this remarkable thing of, of bonding people together and, you know, making people, um, you know, focus on external issues and politics. And, uh, and that's, you know, absolutely a, a good thing. I think the generation that came next did not have that one thing or that one set of things and again it just it fundamentally wasn't a this is good or this is bad point it was this is a difference this generation was was more free to choose their own lifestyle their own ideas their own uh, you know there was not these big national youth trends I mean everyone called it Gen X but it didn't everyone also you know, I think just that name Gen X like X what does it mean like no one could actually figure out what it meant there were all sorts of um, sort of uh, stereotypes about what it meant. But I, th I think when you look within the generation, you saw people doing just a remarkable amount of different things. It was very hard to put them together. They were the ones getting married at 20, 25, 35, 40, or you know, having a house. Or starting in internet, you yeah. know, Google. Yeah. And <laughs> they, they were leading lives in all sorts, all sorts of out of order ways. Um, and that, I think it was just an actual, uh, you know, I think if you think about freedom and what it means, You'd have to say, you know, freedom is, you'll see it when you see people making different choices. Like, 
that's when you actually are seeing freedom and not just people sort of saying, oh, like, we're the freest generation. Yeah. I want to uh, go back to a couple things. Uh, you mentioned the, the grotto. Yes. Um, you're one of the founders of that. And for anyone listening who happens to be a freelance writer and kind of toiling alone, the, 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 the idea was to provide a space where all of you could be together, share ideas, kind of an incubator, and in a way, almost force each other to start writing every day. Right, absolutely, have that social pressure um, to, to get writing. And we started it in uh, 1996 with uh, six writers in a small flat in San Francisco. And then uh, three years later, got a nine-person space. And then three years after that, we got a 21-person space, 21 uh, space. And now we have 35 offices in downtown San Francisco. We have a... Uh, um, you know, 9,000 square foot office space. And uh, we get in there every day and we, we, we treat it like a job. This grotto concept um, has really helped freelance writers find a home, motivate them to work, and even give them work. You pass That's around right. work. Right. So it, it helps uh, emotionally, you know, as a freelance writer, to spend all day alone is a, it's a real burden of the job. So there's a mental health aspect to it that's, that's I think we all lead a little healthier lives. But over time, there's actually a bottom line aspect to it. There's people sharing assignments when they can't do them. But the publishing industry is a, is a tremendously difficult thing to figure out, either on the magazine side or the book side. And the amount of information that gets gathered by 35 writers, we've had over 50 books come out of the grotto. The names of agents, the, you know, the ways to negotiate contracts, the little problems you run into, the how to publicize a book, you know, all of that stuff. Um, we just have this tremendous gathering of, of information, and we don't do it in any formal way. This is all sort of expected to happen organically, you know, people just sharing information. The tone of the place is that you share information with everyone else, you know, absolutely willingly, and it's worked out just uh, remarkably well. You mentioned your own mental health and how the grotto helps that. Um, I understand that you're working a, on a book now about mental health in general and mental illness and how it is perceived globally. That's right how we affect the perception of mental illness globally. And the most interesting part of that is that any, any mental illness is tied with culture. The, how you express depression, for instance, or post-traumatic stress disorder, or even schizophrenia, has cultural components to it. When the mind is unstuck, we look around us to culture to understand how we express ourselves. So the symptomology of mental illness and culture are very tied together. And so what we're seeing today is America and the West having this tremendous influence over the way people think about mental illness around the world through the DSM, through the drug companies. Diagnostic. The, 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 yeah, the, the, stati the diagnostic manuals, research, um, the World Health Organization, all these different a aspects. We get tremendous amount of respect around the world for our ideas about mental health. Now, the most interesting part of it is that as we do that and as we help people around the world um, and engage them, we're actually changing the nature of the, th of the thing we're treating. We're changing the nature of mental illness in both good ways and, and bad ways. So I'm trying to document a number of cases in which a mental illness is sort of, um, is changing thanks to our participation. Are we making people sicker? Are we, are we telling them, you know, or creating illness where there isn't any in? in no, mental illness is, is a worldwide thing. So what you, we're changing is the expression. But the, the problematic part of that is that the expression of mental illness in a given culture is tied with the way a culture would heal from it as well. So when, if we were to go in and change the notion of depression in Japan from a somatic, uh, all-body, physical s symptom to... So in other words, when Japanese get depressed, they feel it all over. Uh, traditionally, Asians would, would have aches and pains and, and, um, and to a more Western notion of depression as existential angst. Um, we may be disconnecting their, that that expression of depression from the way the culture would naturally heal from it. But we'd certainly be selling more pills. Well, we'd be selling a lot more pills. And I think in the case of depression in Japan, that's exactly what's happened, that the drug companies have gone in there and very studiously actually thought about changing the cultural conception of depression such that it matches the notion of taking a pill to cure it. Have you found in your research places yet where people don't seem to be very depressed? No, depression is, is, is worldwide. Um, I mean, there is, there is the, the, the ultimate uh, sort of question of whether, um, I mean, depression and things like, uh, you know, ADHD and, and the overdiagnosing of mental illness within the West and within uh, developed nations 
industrialized nations. Um, there is the question of whether we want to be in charge of spreading that, um, that way of thinking about the mind around the world, and I think we really are, you know. Um, so, you know, depression is not, there's not one, you know, it's not a clear diagnostic thing. It's a, it's a gray area, and I think uh, as we go around the world, um, spreading our notions of, of, of mental illness, we're actually also spreading that notion of psychologizing people. People think about mental illness a lot more, they tend to, the diagnoses go up. But, and then again, the most interesting thing is, well, does that mean we're just, cha are we actually seeing more depressed people in that place? Or are we simply getting them to speak differently? And I, th I think more than we think, when we look for something and find it and talk about it, we're actually, to an extent, creating it. That's what extent. I wondered, is yes. if we're making more sick people. Well, I'm sure you would argue that all over the world, tribes in whatever fashion help people who are feeling down can, can, can really provide uh, Absolutely. assistance and help yeah. that isolation when you're depressed or mentally ill is certainly spirals it. It's, it's a critical component, and it's, it's, it may answer one of the most fascinating questions in cross-cultural research, which is, why do schizophrenics in, in uh, poorer countries do better than schizophrenics in the first world? And you hit on one of the key reasons researchers think that might be true, is um, the social support remains uh, intact for the schizophrenic in the third world because they tend to live in very tight family units where the schizophrenic in the first world can get lost. There's not a lot of mystery to this. If people want to open the, these ties, yeah. if they were, all you need to do is talk to the person next to you on the plane, talk to you, somebody right. in the restaurant. I mm -hmm. talked to a woman, woman in a restaurant in Chicago once who uh, became a lifelong friend yeah. and uh, through her met a lot of people. Yeah. And so it's doable for everybody, even if they wa don't want to do it in this fashion very intensely, you can extend your network. I think that the, the success you have in life and both in terms of you know your career and your love life and the, your joy in life often comes through the power of what you of exactly what you said they call the social scientists call it the weak ties it's the people in your group that you don't quite know they're just on the outskirts of the, your group and those networks get lit up for a variety of reasons when you need help in some way when you need a job when you need to find a romantic partner you light up your your network of weak ties. And there is a way to, to, to maintain those and think about them and to keep that network very vibrant. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thanks, it was, it was enjoy, enjoyable to talk to you. That's all the time we have. You've been listening to author Ethan Waters, who spoke with me at the Sun Valley Writers Conference. Thanks to the conference and to Mr. Waters for finding time in his schedule for our conversation. For more information, please go to our website at idahoptv.org. And we hope you'll tune in same time next week. For Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. To order a copy of this program from Idaho Public Television, call our toll-free number or visit us on the World Wide Web.